Um, um, some of the chapters in your book. Um, yeah. So let's start with the first one, the Paleolithic. Paleolithic, uh, yeah. Yeah. What, so I, what time of period was this, and what were the major events in this period? So it's a. Uh, I mean, Paleo is is old in in Greek, so it's a long, a long time ago. And the the issue I deal, sorry, the mystery I deal with here is you know the question of what happened to Neanderthals and other species of humans. So. If we travel back in time a hundred thousand years, the world would be so different to the one in which we live in in today. Um, it wouldn't just be, you know, kind of Homo. Oh, sorry, Homo sapiens wouldn't be the only species of of humans. Um, in fact, Homo sapiens were limited to largely tropical tropical Africa, and then if you came up to Western Europe um, and actually Western Eurasia in general, you'd find Neanderthals. If you moved eastwards towards Tibet and China, you would find another species of human called Denisovans, which are, are similar to to Neanderthals but treated as a distinct species. And hmm. you know, you get down as well to Southeast Asia, and there are other other species of of, of humans like uh, Homo floresiensis or Homo floresiensis. Uh, so which, exciting! Yeah, which yeah. is colloquially known as the the Hobbit because it was about a meter tall. And, really, really small. <laughs> yeah, and seemed to have disproportionately large large feet. And I guess this kind of Tolkien analogy works quite quite well because you know if we think of um, Lord of the Rings and the the yeah. Fellowship who went to to Mount Doom, it wasn't just humans, right? It was hobbits and dwarfs and elves and and and, and some humans. And the world was a bit like that a um, hundred thousand hundred thousand years ago. And then. About sixty, fifty, forty thousand years ago, something remarkable happens. Um, humans burst out of out of Africa and mm. spread very quickly across not just the old world, but also they get as far as as far as Australia uh, relatively quickly, and all other species of humans disappear. Um, so, by about forty thousand years ago, there there seems to be very little or no trace of of, of, of other species of of humans and. I guess kind of the great Paleolithic mystery is why this why this happened, and the dominant explanation is inherent in the name that we we give ourselves as a species. Which again, it's a pretty hubristic name, <laughs> um, Homo sapiens, uh, wise wise man or wise wise human, and um, you can really see how important this explanation has been when you look at some of the alternative names that were given to Neanderthals. So Ernst Haeckel, who was a German zoologist, biologist um, in the in the late 19th century, suggested calling Neanderthals Homo stupidus, so stupid man, <laughs> to um, differentiate themselves from from, from 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 us. But you know, and, and this explanation is, you know, it's kind of uh, it's still very very widespread. You know, if you read um, Harari *Sapiens*, this is the explanation: is that we were we were just smarter um, than other species of humans, and we were able to outcompete them. But there's a couple of problems with this explanation. Mm. Um, one is that Homo sapiens have been around for at least 150,000 years. Um, sorry, sorry. Homo sapiens have been around for at least 200,000 years before they they pushed out of out of Africa. So this is a long time for our our superiority to mm. to kind of pay off, um, but also archaeologists are increasingly discovering evidence that Neanderthals weren't these kind of brutish cavemen that we're we we've been kind of told to to think they are. That they're actually kind of highly sophisticated um, humans who were capable of, of complex behaviour. So um, were capable of painting cave walls, um, buried their dead, maybe even with wildflowers put on top of the, hmm. the graves. The they, larger brains than we have. The larger brains, they could they could talk, um, it seems quite clear. They seem to be able to travel between islands in the Mediterranean um, because evidence of Neanderthals has been found on on um, Greek, Greek islands, uh, for for example. And so this raises the question of what what the hell happened to Neanderthals and other species of humans. And I think you know, climate change is is part of the the explanation. They were living in in northern Europe. Um, oh, sorry, they were living in in um, Europe at the time, and so that was that was kind of really really affected by by the ice age. Um, and so so they would have struggled because of that. But also, infectious diseases appear to have played a, 
a big role. And one clue for this is just the fact that humans and you know, there's four of us in this room and each of us will have probably about 2% Neanderthal DNA in our, in our genome. And the genes that we've retained aren't random gene variants. They are um, genes that have given our ancestors an advantage as they were pushing out of Africa and settling in new, new environments. And some of these relate to our skin color, our body hair, our eye color. Mm. But many of these are um, genes that, that relate to the immune system. So this seems to show that as we were pushing out of Africa, we were encountering new diseases that were carried by other species of humans. And by interbreeding with these other species of humans, we were able to basically to kind of acquire wholesale um, these gene variants that helped to survive. It was kind of like prehistoric body hacking, I, I suppose. Um, and so it seems to be the case that because Homo sapiens and Neanderthals had been separated for 500,000, maybe 750,000 years, we'd evolved in different disease environments and we had um, developed to cope with different pathogens. So when we, when we met again, um, pathogens that you know, we could deal with and didn't make us very sick made Neanderthals incredibly sick, maybe even killed them and vice versa. Uh, but Homo sapiens survived and Neanderthals were, were wiped out because we were coming from a, a tropical environment and you know, kind of very simple science is that if you're, if you're close to the equator, more of the sun's energy hits the earth. Mm. So you have more vegetation, you have more animals living on that vegetation and more microbes living on those, on those animals. And therefore there's more opportunities for pathogens to jump over to humans. And so when we were pushing out of, out of Africa, we would have carried more and more deadly infectious, infectious diseases. So unwittingly we had this, this secret weapon that allowed us to um, defeat Neanderthals and other species of, 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 of humans. Mm. Um, so I think even, even when we go back to the very beginning of, of the history of a Homo sapien dominated world, it wasn't because we were, were more intelligent than everyone else. It was just some happen chance, some, some kind of serendipity that we, we were able to, um, we were able to, to, to survive while other species of humans died, mm. died out. We definitely hunger for that one uh, evidence or that one happening like a clash or like the big difference just to have this our natural sense to to an easy explanation to to satisfy our curiosity yes yeah yeah definitely definitely and then if we if we go on to the next the next chapter we talk about um the neolithic period mm. um so the emergence of of farming and again it's a interesting quirk of of history that the adoption of settled agriculture didn't occur in, in Europe. It occurred first of all in the Middle East, and then you had various other um, agricultural revolutions in, in India, in China, in Africa, even in, in the Americas. Um, but this created um, the perfect environment for infectious diseases to, to emerge and, and spread. Um, there's an American anthropologist called James, James C. Scott, Jim Scott, and he refers to the first settlements as multi-species resettlement camps um, because they were, they, were, they were kind of settlements where you know, all sorts of species came together and this was where we see the emergence of the, of, you know, as I said earlier, many of the infectious diseases that, that have plagued humanity for the last few, few, thousand, few thousand years. Um, and it's really, it's really interesting because up until a few years ago, it was more or less impossible to research the topic of, of you know, what infectious, were, what infectious diseases were doing to humans before there was written evidence. Um, but advances in the ability to extract and to analyze um, DNA from ancient humans has, has kind of, it's, it's been absolutely transformed in the last few years. And so it's amazing how much new evidence is, is, is coming out. So basically when, when scientists remove DNA from, from ancient bones, they don't just get human genetic material, they also get genetic material belonging to microbes that were in the blood of humans when they, when they died. So it can help you at least make an educated guess as to what killed, what killed those, those people. And um, certainly Yersinia pestis, so the bacteria that causes plague, has been found all over, 
all over Europe um, and all over Asia uh, between 5,000 and 2,500 thousand years ago. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting because you also see between 5,000 and 4,000 years ago, a massive kind of dip in the population of, of, of Europe. It falls by maybe 50, 60, 60 percent, um, just as plague appears to, to kind of emerge in, in, in the region. And obviously we can't say definitively that this was the cause and it was probably a complex combination of um, malnutrition because of over farming combined with, with infectious diseases. But, uh, you know, this, this crash in the population had a massive, massive impact because Europe's first farmers um, kind of seemed to, seemed to not die out, but they, they, they kind of were vastly reduced in numbers. And then you have about 4,000 years ago, a big influx, a new population group coming from the steppe. Um, so kind of uh, Russia, Ukraine, and they bring with them new genes and new languages. And the, the genes that they brought still account for about 50% of the genome of people in, in Northern, Northern Europe. These were tall, um, you know, kind of tall people with light, light features. And it also seems um, like they were the source of Indo-European languages. So mm. they brought um, the predecessors of modern English, modern modern Norwegian into the into the region. So I, I mean, again, I, I I like to joke, although it's not really a joke. It's 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 um, there's some truth to it that it's amazing we can still literally literally see and hear the impact of of this kind of Neolithic pandemic that occurred. 4,000, 5,000 years ago in, in this recording studio in Norway, in Oslo today. It's, yeah. um, it's bizarre <laughs> to think. So what, uh, what kind of sources we have used, uh, especially, especially for these first chapters, Paleolithic, Neolithic, ancient, what, what uh, sources have you relied on? Yeah, so, I mean, I think what I was trying to do with this book was to bring together sources from really an enormous amount of research that's been undertaken over the last few years in a variety of disciplines. So um, you could think of biology, sociology, um, and archaeology, but also economics, genomics, classics. And a lot of this research is in, you know, really kind of complex language, but also behind paywalls because it's in academic journals and mm. try to kind of um, try to take it and um, put it all together and tell a story about the history of the world that, you know, makes people think in a, in a new way about the impact of, of infectious diseases on, on humans and on, on history. 